1936, Esquire magazine published an article that was written by F. Scott Fitzgerald called The Crack Up. In the article, the famous writer famously said this quote. He said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. One should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless and yet be determined to make them hopeful. I wonder what her reaction would have been. I wonder what Mary's reaction would have been as she stood there next to Jesus' tomb, crying as the heavy haze of hopelessness set in on her. I wonder what the reaction would have been if F. Scott Fitzgerald said to her, come on, Mary, Mary, you see things are hopeless. You you just got to make them hopeful. Psychologists have identified that there are four resources or there's four ways that that people get hope in their lives. They get it through attachment. They get it through empowerment. They get it through survival and they get it through spirituality. They get it through attachment or connection to somebody in their life. They get it through empowerment, someone who who compliments their strengths and validates them. They get it through survival, that there is, if you are in a bad situation, the chance at survival, the ability to get out of it. And finally, spirituality, that there's something or or someone greater that has has power over the things in this life that, that do seem hopeless. And Mary stood, having lost all four of those resources in one fell swoop. She was there on Good Friday and she saw him die. She was there and she watched Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus put him in the tomb. And that attachment, the connection that she had to her Lord Jesus, gone because he was dead. The empowerment that she got from him, that, that he validated her and her gifts and who she was as a woman, yes, but also as a redeemed child of God, it was done. Survival, the fact that, that Jesus had driven seven demons out of Mary and, and not only allowed her to survive life, but thrive in life. What if the demons came back again? What if, what if her belief in a higher power, what, what if he was gone? The ability uh, to function, Fitzgerald said, is to see that, that things are hopeless and yet make them hopeful. St. John's gospel tells us that Mary was standing there crying and just, just so you have the picture right, this isn't just a a little tear dripping down her cheek as she tries to put this all together. No, she is crying, she is mourning, she is grieving because this is the type of pain that someone incurs when they lose something. She lost Jesus and so she was empty. Empty like the tomb and feeling the heavy haze of hopelessness settle on her. She thought, you know what? Maybe I can, I can find some hope. Maybe, maybe I can make this situation hopeful. You know, Peter, Peter and John, they, they must have missed something. So I'm going to go look in, in the tomb. I'm going to check. And that's what she did. Verse 11 through 13. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know 
where they have put him. Now that is incredible. You think about every other instance in the entire scripture when a human being sees an angel, what happens? Fear. They tremble. In fact, Matthew's gospel tells us when Roman soldiers, the elite fighting force of the first century saw these same two angels, you know what happened? They became like dead men. They shook and crumbled in fear. But Mary? No, not Mary. And why? Because the heavy haze of hopelessness was setting in, obscuring what she could see to the point where she didn't even recognize the angels or their question. Their question, woman, why are you crying? Which was really no question at all. It was used as a statement to point out the fact that if there was a dead person here, there was reason to cry. There was reason to mourn. There was reason for the pain. But look, Mary, Christ sent us here. We're angels, messengers of God to let you know he did what he said. He is risen. But the haze of hopelessness is is that heavy in front of her eyes. She thinks that that hope, hope is something you can make, forgetting that hope is not something you can make. It's the gift that Christ gave. And so that's what she tries to do. Mary tries to manufacture or, or make her own hope. The angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this She turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Hope is not something that you can make. Hope is the gift Christ gave. And so Jesus shows up to Mary, asks her the question, why are you crying? In order to let her know, I am here, Mary. I did what I said. I rose again. And you can picture it, can't you? If it's a movie, you can see the screen, right? The the camera angle is zoomed in on Mary as tears drip and pour down her face. But then she hears the voice. She hears the voice of her Lord behind her and you watch as the camera pans out. You see Jesus and the camera angle turns as she turns and with a shriek of delight, she sees Jesus, wraps her arms around him and says, you're here, my Lord. And we all say he is risen. risen But that's not what happened, is it? It's not what happened. It's not what it says. It says she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. She didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Jesus doesn't just appear. No, that wouldn't have been enough. So he appears and he asks her the question that is really not a question at all. He says, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Because he wants Mary to put it all together, to hear his voice and to have her say his name and realize that he had done what he had promised. But the haze of hopelessness has settled in on Mary to the point where she doesn't even recognize Jesus. And it's not because she didn't know him. No, they were friends. Mary had spent at this point years following Jesus around. They walked together, talked together. They ate together. She knew very well who she was. They weren't just close acquaintances. They were close friends. So why doesn't Mary see him? It's because Hope is not something self-made. And yet that's exactly what Mary is trying to do. She's trying to make hope. She's trying to make hope with a hypothesis. She says, you know what? I, 
I'm not a detective. Haven't played one on TV, but you know what? I bet Joseph of Arimathea, that's it. He sent a gardener here to move the body. That must be it. So thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. The haze of hopelessness is that thick that Mary thinks that hope is something that that could be self-made. She forgets that hope, hope is the gift that Christ is giving to her. How foolish of her, right? I mean, come on, Mary, if you weren't so self-focused, maybe for a second, if you just stopped thinking about yourself, you'd be able to see him, right? You thought that? Well, so maybe, maybe we should pump the brakes a little bit and not just not to be judgmental about Mary, but because you get it, don't you? I do. Most people set their hopes in things, things that aren't Jesus all the time. We put our hope in our careers, in the money we make from our careers. We put our hope in our family, in our friends, in our government. We put our hope in hypotheticals, in uncertain hopes that are even more outlandish than, than Mary's hypothesis that, that the gardener moved Jesus' body. You think about where your hope is found. For some of you, it's, it's in the day that coronavirus will no longer be a thing. For others, it's, it's the hope that things will become better, that I'll be happier when Prince Charming comes and sweeps me off my feet, or Princess Charming. For others, it's, it's yes, I know Jesus lives, alleluia, but you know when Americans will really start to hope? It's when and you pick some current affair, this happens or this stops, then, then we'll be able to live happier. Then we'll be able to live with more hope. For others, work's overwhelming. Parenting is overwhelming. And so we, we put our hope in self-help and exactly what Fitzgerald was talking about, the self-determined hope. You just gotta make it hopeful. Just got to work harder. I wonder, do we even realize it anymore when we ourselves or other people are feeding us hypothetical, uncertain hopes? Do you realize it when, when people say to you things like, oh, it'll get better. All you got to do is just pull yourself up, chin up, just do X, Y, and Z, and it'll all work out. Do we even realize that, that these people are saying less about their ability to predict the future? And these prognosticators are, are saying more about manufacturing, making up hope. Hope that is a hypothesis is hope that's uncertain and it's at best a guess and at worst, it's a lie. So is there any wonder, any reason why the haze of hopelessness so often obscures how we see life, how we see one another, but most importantly, how we see Christ, Christ for you? And do we realize it in time? In 1942, the German Nazis took a man by the name of Viktor Frankl into a concentration camp with his wife and his parents. Viktor Frankl was a prominent Jewish psychologist and neurologist. And while he was in the Nazi concentration camp, his fellow prisoners came to him for support, for strength, 
for the suffering that they were undoubtedly enduring. Viktor Frankl, he, he survived and he wrote a very famous piece of work called Man's Search for Meaning. And in it, he, he outlines examples of how he watched his, his fellow prisoners have hope less and less and end up with despair more and more. One particular example, extreme example that he writes about in the book is of a man who, who had a dream and he, he was sure it was from God. The dream that the war would end on March 30th. And yet as days drew closer and closer to that date and things were becoming very clear that the war was not about to end on March 30th, well, the hopelessness, the haze of hopelessness sat heavy on this man. And before long, it affected his physical health. He couldn't stand up to diseases that were in the camp. And so on March 29th, he, he contracted a fever. On March 30th, 30th, he lay incapacitated, unable to get out of bed. And on the 31st, the man died. We heard the, the quote before from F. Scott Fitzgerald. We read it that one should be able to see that things are hopeless and yet determined to make them otherwise. Can hope really be self-made? Compare that idea to, to what Viktor Frankl wrote about in Man's Search for Meeting about hope. After seeing people in the midst of the most horrendous circumstances, he said this about hope. He said, hope cannot be pursued. Hope must ensue. Hope cannot be pursued. It must ensue. One must have a certain reason to be hopeful. Hope cannot be pursued. It must ensue. In other words, hope cannot be found. It must be founded upon something. As hard as it is to say, and as hard as it is to believe, you can't make hope. You can't manufacture your own hope. You can't discover hope. You can't find hope. But hope has found you. John chapter 20, verses 15 and following thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have yet not ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of your Lord. We're not told how Jesus said her name. We don't know if... Could it be that he, was, that he was in a way rebuking her, disciplining her, Mary? No, at least in my experience, that requires the first name and the middle name. Could it have been uh, out of frustra frustration? Mary, Mary, how many times did I have to tell you that I would rise from the dead? Couldn't have been that either. The rest of the text, the rest of God's word makes it clear that that word, that name that Jesus spoke to her was a word of peace. It was a word of forgiveness and it was a word of hope. Make one thing certain that Jesus Christ came to bring the gift of Easter to Mary, the gift of hope, a certain hope. And make this clear as well, that he came and he brought that gift to her, even when she was running after hypothetical, uncertain hopes, trying to make and manufacture her own hopes. Jesus patiently, lovingly, 
tenderly pursued after her. And what ensued for Mary was indeed the gift of certain hope. Mary, Mary, that's what Jesus says. And to it, she says, Rabboni, and the haze of hopelessness is gone. First Peter chapter one tells us that because of the gift of Easter, the gift that Mary received, the gift that you receive, you have a hope that isn't uncertain, but a hope that is living, a hope that is eternal, and a hope that is certain for you. First Peter writes this, praise be to the God of our father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That sounds like a hope that I want. How about you? (laughs) If you want a hope that's uncertain, look to things like family and friends. You can look to things like your work and your career, the money that comes from those jobs. You can look to romance and relationships. All of those things people have looked to and maybe you are looking to for hope. But if this last year has has taught us anything, it's that anything and, and especially things that are good, they can be taken away. We're so not in control. If this pandemic's taught us anything, it's that life is full of uncertainty. And so if you want a hope that is certain, a hope that isn't based upon the media cycle or the latest coronavirus uh, map and model, if you want a hope that isn't based on trends, but is based on the rock solid foundation of Jesus Christ, who couldn't, couldn't be held down by the stone cold grip of death or a stony tomb, and look no farther than Jesus. The Jesus who says your name, Jesus who makes it clear that that hope isn't something self-made, but it is the gift that he gave to Mary and to you. And maybe it, it goes without saying that that's a gift for you as much as it is for Mary. But maybe it's something that we should talk about for just a second. Because you and I both know that that there's so many things in life that that do cause uncertainty, that do cause hopelessness. And and so often we can't help it. They're out of our control. The haze of hopelessness settles on us and there's not a thing we can do. But you also know that there's often times where you and I make choices, decisions, We say and do things where we walk right into it. We walk right into that haze of hopelessness ourselves. And sometimes, well, it's hard to see the hope that we have. I'm thinking about people who maybe haven't been to church for a while and it's not because of coronavirus. But it's because you wonder, is this this really a place for me? And sure, we can put a lot of the fault on the institution of church. People aren't perfect. But it's also because you wonder if the way I think, the way I live, the people that I've slept with, the things that I do, the divorce, the divorces, (laughs) these mean I can... I can have this haze that is in my life lifted. Is there hope? And it's even people who who are at church all the time who who feel the exact same way. It's a thought back to something that you said or did a while ago that, that makes you feel that haze of hopelessness all over again. It's that sin that you've apologized for again and again and again and again, but you keep doing. So you you wonder about the hope in Christ, 
while you look yourself in the mirror and, and think, I'm hopeless. It's for the people who are full of hope, who are happy on the outside, but inside, well, they're the only ones who are in on the sin that no one else knows about, and they wonder, can I ever be as hope-filled and as happy as I pretend to be? If that's you, this story is for you. Mary's story is your story, and it's a story about the hope that Christ gave, something that isn't self-made. Because did you know where Mary was before she stood next to the empty tomb? Mary was standing next to the foot of the cross. Do you know where Mary was before that? Mary was following Jesus. She was one of the group of women who, who helped support Jesus and one of the disciples who, who helped serve him in his ministry. You know where she was before that? The Bible tells us that Mary was possessed by seven demons. Seven! Seven demons! Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if, if Mary was in your small group and you were trying to explain to her about how, how you feel hopeless, about how your life feels empty, your past seems so dark that, that you don't know if, if there's any hope for you. Can you picture Mary sitting across from you, listening, maybe arms folded, nodding, pretending to empathize as she looks at you and hears about how, oh, you, you messed up that relationship, you you did that to a family member? Seven demons! <laughs> she hears how you're someone who worries too much, drinks too much, swears too much, gossips too much. Seven demons! <laughs> Look, what, what would it mean for you if Jesus himself came behind you and said your name? Would it pull you? Would it lift you out of the haze of hopelessness? Would it lift you out of the pit of despair? Would it pull you up out of the pit, the funk of guilt and shame? Because let me make this one thing certain. The gift of Easter is certain hope. Hope isn't something self-made. It is the gift that Christ gave and he has so loved you that he came to die for you, rise to you so that you could have that hope. And let me make one more thing clear that even when we go our way, making up our own hypothetical, conditional hopes that are uncertain, he pursues us. He pursues us with all of his love, with all of his passion, with all of his mercy, so that he can say your name and give you that certain hope. You wonder, when does he say my name? Scripture tells us that before time began, he knew you and he chose you. The Bible tells us that before he died, the night before he died, he prayed for you. The Bible tells us that in time, God took on flesh for you and died for you and rose for you but then in your own life, he gave you a new name. He called you his daughter, his son. In the waters of your baptism, he united you with himself. In the Lord's Supper, he gives you himself in the most tangible way, speaking to you, putting his name literally on your tongue, reminding you that you are his and he is yours. That's the certain hope he gives. And it's Easter. And so most Christians, they know. You know that you should be happy and full of hope on Easter. Most Christians also know that that hope is definitely there for heaven someday. But I worry, I worry that Christians forget that that hope is also for right now. That hope is a living hope for your life as you live. How do we know that? We know that because the promises of a dead man who raised himself to life 
carry a whole lot of weight. The promise that Jesus gave to you, the promise that Jesus spoke to you, that you're never gonna be alone means that you can have certain hope that no matter where you go, he is always with you. The promise that Jesus gave to you, that he knows all of your fears. And so whether you fear coronavirus or you fear something going on in our current country, or you fear something in your own personal life, he already knows and nothing's gonna separate you from him. That's a promise. You can be certain of that. The promise that he hears all of your prayers. The promise that he loves you. It, it means that you can be certain that he loves you more than you could possibly imagine. That you don't have to wish that he strengthens you. You don't have to wish that he protects you. You don't have to wish that he loves you and forgives you. That you can be certain of these things because that's the gift of Easter. That's what I wish I told him. <laughs> to be honest, I don't even know his name, but I was thinking about Easter while I was at the gym the other day and the guy working out next to me had a massive butterfly tattoo right here on his leg. I don't know why. I don't know what came over me, but I, I had to ask him about it. And my question was pretty lame. <laughs> I asked him, is that a butterfly on your leg? <laughs> Thankfully, he was kind enough to answer and, and enjoy a conversation. He said, yeah, it, it actually is. And it's the first tattoo that I ever got. He had many more. And because he answered my first question, <laughs> I felt emboldened to ask another one. I, I said, so why'd you get it? What do butterflies mean for you? I was surprised that he answered that too. He said, you know, I have a lot of anxiety. You know, butterflies in your stomach. So that's why I got the tattoo. Because it was my first tattoo, I didn't want to put it on my stomach, so I put it on my leg. By this time, his friend walked over and wondered why two guys were talking about his butterfly tattoo. And I don't know why I said this then too, but I said, I love butterflies too. In fact, I love what they symbolize. I said to him, did you know that for 2000 years, butterflies have meant a whole lot to Christians? Did you know that? I told him that for, for the past 2,000 years, butterflies have, have symbolized the resurrection of Christ for Christians. In the same way that, that Christ was, was laid inside the ground, inside of a tomb, and, and three days later rose from the tomb again. Well, it's like a butterfly who first as a caterpillar crawls through the muck of life, but then goes inside a cocoon only to come out again as something beautiful. And in the same way Christ did that, well, we will too. We will, though we die, rise again new, a renewed and beautiful creation for those who believe in Christ. This time I think he was a little surprised. So <laughs> he just looked at me and he said, thank you, that's awesome. And we, we said farewell. But I wish I could have told him what I've told you that that hope and, and what that resurrection means is for the butterflies in your stomach even today. Psychologists tell us that, that humans have four resources of hope. Attachment, empowerment, survival, and spirituality. You wanna talk about the resource that you have for hope? Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Attachment, a sense of trust and connection. In Christ, we all will be made alive. Romans 6 tells us that by your baptism, you are connected to Christ's death and his resurrection. You want to talk about the idea of empowerment? <sighs> if only for this life we have hope, we are most of all to be pitied. But Christ indeed has been raised from the dead. That means you have hope 
and you're not to be pitied. You want to talk about survival? You can survive anything in life, even death, because of this. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? And if that doesn't put your faith, your hope in the spiritual, in God, well, we give thanks. We give thanks that it does because he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death can't touch you, which means nothing in life can harm you. It means that because you are wrapped up in the cocoon of Christ, and therefore, whenever we look at life, we get to do it from this viewpoint of a cool detachment that we have the wings of hope, that we can fly over whatever is temporary because you have a hope that is eternal. That is the gift of Easter. Hope isn't something self-made. It's the gift that Christ gave to you today and every day. Amen.